This is Matt McGemory, sales agronomist with Burris. Today we're going to start part three of our insecticide mode of action series. Now, we previously talked in general about how insecticides work and we've talked specifically about how OP and carbamate insecticides work. Today we're going to talk about pyrethroid insecticides. As we've done in previous sessions, it's important that we briefly review how signals travel through the nervous system. Remember, as we said in session two, this can be pretty deep stuff. So if you've not watched our first insecticide mode of action series, we would recommend that you stop, go back, review that session, session one, and return to this after you've watched session one. For those that have already done so, we're going to dive right in. Remember the brain of the insect initiates the important signals that tell the insect's body what needs to be done. Those signals travel from nerve cell to nerve cell, from neuron to neuron. The signals go through the nerve cell, are then changed into a chemical signal, and travel across a gap to the next nerve cell. Eventually, the signal reaches its destination, and the insect's body knows what needs to be done. As we've said before, the application of an insecticide, a nerve toxin insecticide, disrupts the transfer of information from cell to cell in some form or fashion. And when that happens, the brain tells what needs to be done, but the signal never gets to its destination. Think of it like chemically inducing some kind of uh, nerve injury, if you like. Except that in this case, the injury to the nervous system is lethal for the insect because its ability to breathe, move, flex its body so blood moves around. All of that is compromised. I also want you to note that the disruption of the signal from one neuron to the next neuron can happen in many different locations in the nerve cell. Some insecticides will mess up the signal as it comes into the cell through the branches of the nerve cell, what we call the dendrites. Remember, the ability of a nerve cell to fire is based on the charge inside the cell changing from a net negative to a net positive charge. The inside is more negative and the outside is more positive. A chemical signal is released from one neuron and is inserted into the door of the next neuron. When those doors open, positive charged material rushes in and changes the charge. That is when the cell is activated, so to speak. If you remember back to our last session on OP and carbamate insecticides, they mess up this part of the process. Now another potential site of activity, I suppose one that would be at least theoretically possible, is that a chemical would disrupt the signal in the neuron at the roots of this nerve cell, what we call the terminal branches. The terminal branches, the roots, you may remember, are the portion that actively moves a nerve impulse chemically from the cell toward the neighboring cell. Pyrethroids actually disrupt the portion of the cell that is in between the branches and the roots. They mess up the trunk of the neuron. We often refer to these products as sodium channel modulators. Products like Pounce, Warrior, Force, a portion of Aztec, all of those are registered trademarks, belong to this grouping of insecticides. They're basically synthetic versions of naturally occurring insecticides that are produced in mums. They usually break down more rapidly than do other insecticides. I said that pyrethroids mess up the nerve signal in the trunk. It's probably important we get the correct terms on the table. So the correct term for the trunk of a neuron is the axon. And pyrethroids are therefore sometimes also called axonic nerve poisons. Let's take a brief look at how a signal is supposed to move down the axon. And think of an electrical signal moving from the branches to the root of a nerve cell as being similar to electricity maybe flowing within a wire. Every once in a while you have to boost the signal because otherwise the signal slowly wears away. The same thing is happening in the axon. A positive charge starts to work its way down the axon, but as it does it begins to wear down.
Do you notice how much the signal began to wear down in this diagram? Just imagine what would happen if the signal kept going minus a boost. Luckily the nervous system has a mechanism to fix that problem. The presence of the charge causes gates to open. Positive charged particles therefore rush in and they boost the signal back to its full strength. And so the process continues again, and the signal wears down just like it did before. The weak signal causes gates to open again, sodium rushes in, the signal is boosted, and the impulse continues down the neuron just as it did before. How do pyrethroids mess up what we just saw? Well, pyrethroids make the axon a little too free with those gates that boost the signal. Let me show you what I mean. Once again, we have our axon, our trunk of the neuron, with all those positively charged sodium particles just waiting to rush in. When we apply a pyrethroid, it attaches to those gates that we mentioned earlier, and it wedges those gates open when they should not be opened. You know what happens now. Sodium is just waiting to rush in. The gates are suddenly open when they should not be. And sodium takes the opportunity that's provided to it. The result of this is that the trunk doesn't just become positive inside. It becomes super positive inside. And it gets positively charged when it's not supposed to be. Let's use another metaphor here. It's kind of like you took an interstate and suddenly filled it with cars. When a message needs to get through, it hits the bad traffic jam and it can't get anywhere. So the signal to breathe, to move, to transfer blood just can't get through the trunk. And you know what that means. It means that we've taken the nervous system and we've chemically severed its ability to transfer info. Pyrethroids were a revolutionary tool when they were first released to growers. They came at a time that more persistent products were creating substantial environmental concerns. And by degrading a little more rapidly than those products, pyrethroids became a useful tool that resulted in fewer off-target interactions. Unfortunately, as has been the case with every other pest management tool, Resistance is an issue. Thanks for watching. We look forward to part four of this series when we'll discuss the newest insecticide family, neonicotinoids.